That's the summary of the second chapter. I think you can find that summary in the introduction of the book. They give a summary of each of the chapters. Mm -hmm. Okay, first verse. Sanjaya said, Seeing Arjuna full of compassion, his mind depressed, his eyes full of tears, Madhusudan Krishna spoke the following words. So the first verse of the second chapter spoken by Sanjaya. Sanjaya is of course talking to Dhritarashtra. They're not on the battlefield. So Prabhupada comments on this word Madhu Sudana. The word Madhu Sudana is significant in this verse. Lord Krishna killed the demon Madhu and now Arjuna wanted Krishna to kill the demon of misunderstanding that had overtaken him in the discharge of his duty. So addressing Lord Krishna as Madhusudana, this is, this is done by Sanjaya, or we could say this is Vyasa's description not exactly Sanjay's words, but Vyasa. Vyasa, of course, he knows the identity of Lord Krishna. Therefore, he could address him as Madhusudan. So from Prabhupada's purport of this first verse, Prabhupada speaking about compassion, comparing real and false compassion Compassion for the dress of a drowning man is senseless. You can see in the illustration, the man in the boat, he saved the jacket and the poor man is drowning. The man in the boat, he's happy, I've saved the jacket, but the man is drowning. And so Prabhupada gave this example about material welfare work he compared it like this, that we are oft, we're often engaged in welfare activities which is simply beneficial for the body. So it's not actually compassion, it's actually misdirected compassion. Prabhupada comments, a man fallen in the ocean of nescience cannot be saved simply by rescuing his outward dress, the gross material body. One who does not know this and laments for the outward dress is called a sudra, or one who laments unnecessarily. So that kind of compassion. I remember there was a there was a concert, there was a big concert held in New York. Uh, George Harrison, at that time, he'd been expressing a lot of interest in Krishna consciousness. And George Harrison had organized a big concert. It was held in the Madison Square Gardens there in New York City. And uh, the idea was to raise money for Bangladesh. It was at the time when Bangladesh was separated from Pakistan. You know, after the partition, Bangladesh and Pakistan were one government, but then Bangladesh and Pakistan separated. So Bangladesh had no money, and George Harrison was helping them raise money. He organized this concert. Prabhupada said, this is like putting oil on the hair. He said, there's already so much oil on the hair, and you want to put more on the hair. What's the good? Is it useless? So Prabhupada gave these different kinds of examples uh, to explain false compassion, which is so prominent in the material world. Compassion based on the body is not actually compassion. Okay, going ahead, second verse. Lord Krishna is speaking now. 
Kutastra Kashmalam idam Vishame Samupashtitam Anarya Justa Maswargyam Akirti Karam Arjuna. The Supreme Personality of God had said, My dear Arjuna, how have these impurities come upon you? They are not at all befitting a man who knows the value of life. They lead not to higher planets, but to infamy. Confirmed by the clouds. All right, so Arjun, uh, Lord Krishna is giving strong words to Arjuna. He is not very pleased with Arjuna. He's, how have these impurities come up? They are not befitting a man, right? They're anarya justum. They're not befitting an arya, someone who knows an aryan. An arya is one who knows the values of life, but somebody who doesn't know the value of life is anarya. And Lord Krishna said, you're going to go to infamy. You won't go to higher planets, you'll go to this, some disgraceful place. So Krishna chastises Arjuna in these two verses, number two and number three. Krishna is really chastising Arjuna. He uses these words, kuta. In the presence of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Arjuna's lamentation for his kinsmen is certainly unbecoming. And therefore Krishna expressed his surprise with the word kuta, where from? And then anarya justum, not befitting an Aryan. The word Aryan is applicable to person who knows the value of life and have a civilization based on spiritual realization. Right? We talk, sometimes the people talk about the Aryan invasion, but the real Aryans were there already. <laughs> the people who lived there in India, they were the real Aryans. It wasn't that the Aryans came from Europe. <laughs> the, the Europeans, they were the uncivilized people. The Aryans were the people who really lived there. So Prabhupada says, the word Aryan means one who knows the value of life. They have a civilization based on spiritual realization. So this word, this term Aryan is often misused. Then Aswargyam, Arjuna's impurities will not lead him to Swargaloka. So Swargaloka, heaven. Hmm materialistic people, they often desire to go to heaven, to enjoy the opulence and the facilities of heaven. Long life, and intelligence, and bodily beauty, everything is there in the heavenly planets. But, of course we know that it's also temporary, you cannot remain there in Swargaloka. Later on Lord Krishna will describe, from the highest planet down to the lowest, all are places of misery. Anyway, just now, Krishna is speaking that your impurities, Arjuna, will not allow you to go to higher planets. Akirti karam, such a behavior will only cause him infamy. Oh, you're going to lose your good name and reputation. You behave like this, it's not going to do you any good. So Krishna is really speaking strongly to Arjuna and we'll see it, it has a good effect on Arjuna. Vishame, in such a critical situation, with so many depending on you, how do you manifest such impurities? Kashmalam. The impurities. So here we are in the middle in the middle of the battlefield, and you're speaking like this. It's a very critical situation, and so many are depending on Arjuna. Certainly, he's a very key player 
in the battle of Kurukshetra. As Krishna says, so many are depending on you. How can you show these impurities? What a time to come out with all of these impurities. Okay. So here we see Arjuna kneeling at the feet of Lord Krishna. Srila Prabhupada explains, he was thinking that by showing that compassion, he'll be eulogized by Krishna. But Krishna condemned it, just the opposite. In other words, Krishna is very strict also. That is the qualification of Krishna and his associates. Bajra api kotara and kushuma api komala. Softer than a flower and harder than a thunderbolt. So Krishna is not lenient to his friend or to his devotee because that leniency will not help the devotee. All right. Do you remember hearing this example? Softer than a flower, harder than a thunderbolt. When was it? Who, who was? Here Lord Krishna is being described in his dealings with Arjuna. Can you think of some more examples where this uh, softer than a flower and harder than a thunderbolt comes over? Yes? Hare Krishna? Who else? When did you hear this example? Who was it used by? When? Yes, when? When he uh, chastised his servant, when he was looking at uh, sannyasi, being a sannyasi, he was looking at a woman. He asked him to leave, right? I forgot his name. Junior Haridas. Ah, oh, Junior Haridas. Yes, yes, yes. Right. Right. What happened? He, he, he put him out from his association, right? He said, Can it come? To me, can it come in my presence again? So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu could be like a thunderbolt, and how? In what way was he softer than a flower? Anybody? Chaitanya Mahaprabhu could be very strict and he could also be very kind also. Maharaj, he accepted. Yes, what happened? Maharaj. Yes, go ahead, Maharaj. Maharaj, he accepted uh, everybody no matter what, like, and uh, he, like, uh, uh, for example, even the Mayavadi like Prakashanand Saraswati Sarvabhom, he was uh, very kind to them and even accepted them. Also forgave the Chand Kazi like after a lot of discussion. So in that terms he was softer okay. with his devotees. Yeah. Anybody else? Dukhi Maharaj, Dukhi, uh, in the Mahaprakash Lila, Dukhi who was bringing that oh, the lady, yeah, the maid servant yes, yes. in the home of Srivas Thakur was bringing the yes, water yes. from the Ganga. And Ch Ch what did Chaitanya Mahaprabhu do? He gave her uh, the pure bhakti and she was chanting and he, she, she was then called Sukhi. She was before called Dukhi. Right. Then she's yes, changed the name from Dukhi to Sukhi. And also another example was when uh, Shivananda Singh's wife was carrying a baby. Then Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was very pleased. And he said also, he said, when the child is born, you should call the child, give the child the name Puri, Puri Das. Right? And so Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was not against people in family life. 
On one hand, he was very strict with sannyasis, but he was not against people in family life, having a family and having children. Rather, he would congratulate them. Very nice, you're bringing a child into the world. And he gave the name for the child. And there are many pastimes, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, with the children of devotees. So in this way, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was showing himself to be softer than a flower, and at the same time, sometimes harder than a thunderbolt. Mm. All right. Any other examples? Okay, can you give me the pastimes? Pastimes, I'm not sure, but uh, Ma, uh, Srila Prabhupada is always strict with me, with, with his sadhana, and he's very strict with his devotees, but uh, with his disciples, but uh, when it comes to compassion, Srila Prabhupada is very, very compassionate person. Yes, certainly, uh, Prabhupada would be quite strict sometimes with the sannyasis. He would tell them, have to conquer oversleeping. If they slept too much, Prabhupada would complain. He said, sannyas is not meant for eating and sleeping. You have, you have to conquer over eating and sleeping, the mood of the Goswamis. So in that way Prabhupada was quite strict and at the same time Prabhupada could be very merciful. If he saw devotees with some kind of infection or poor health, Prabhupada would give them some advice what to do, how to treat the problem. Sometimes he would give them, if they were lacking cloth, sometimes he would give them cloth to, so they could keep warm in the winter, things like this. Lord Nityananda also could get very angry, right? What's the example? Well, Lord Nityananda got angry. Someone? Yes, somebody like to tell me, Lord Nityananda, you remember when he got quite angry? You know, if there's a lot of background noise here, it's good you turn off your microphone because it's quite distracting to hear people in the background doing things. Thank you. So, Lord Nityananda, he was traveling with the devotees to go to Jagannath Puri and he had to wait one day. They were waiting under a tree. They had to wait while Shivananda Singh dealt with the officials at the border and he was paying taxes and arranging papers and it took some time. And so Lord Nityananda got quite angry and Lord Nityananda cursed the sons of Shivananda Singh to die. And when Shivananda Singh came, Lord Nityananda kicked him. <laughs> so Lord Nityananda could, you know, sometimes like a thunderbolt. And even when Lord Nityananda, when Shivananda Singh came, then he found his wife was crying and he asked her what's wrong and, he, and she said, Lord Nityananda has cursed our sons to die. And Shivananda Singh, Shivananda Singh replied that if Lord Nityananda wants our sons to die, let them die. And, and when Lord Nityananda kicked him, and then Shivananda Singh thanked Lord Nityananda and said, Today I am blessed to have the dust of your lotus feet on my body. And so, uh, Lord Nityananda was like a thunderbolt, but Lord Nityananda could also be very, very kind, also like a flower. We know that when uh, Jagai and Madhai attacked him, right? that it was Lord Nityananda who pleaded on behalf of Jagai and Madhai that in this age must be merciful. 
All right. So this is the nature of a devotee. Here Prabhupada is talking Krishna is very strict. He, Krishna is not lenient to his friend or to his devotee because that leniency will not help the devotee. Right? The real mercy is the strictness. And Prabhupada found his own spiritual master very strict, right? Do you remember the pastime? Prabhupada got the mercy of his spiritual master. Maharaj, was it the time when uh, Prabhupada was uh, translating uh, for an old man who couldn't hear properly? And Bhakti Siddhan Saraswati Maharaj chastised him, saying, Don't talk in my lecture. Like yeah, you're, uh, he, but Prabhupada was not translating for the old man. They were both listening to the lecture. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati was lecturing and the old man was sitting behind and he touched Prabhupada on the shoulder. So Prabhupada turned around to look at him to see what he wanted. And immediately Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati stopped talking and he addressed the two of them because it's an offense to talk. When the Acharya is speaking, it's an offense to talk something else. So he immediately chastised the two of them and he said to the old man, he said, do you think you have purchased me because you did give a donation of a few rupees every month? And then he said to our beloved Srila Prabhupada, he said, do you want to come up here and talk? And Prabhupada said it was the moment of greatest mercy. He said, I could have died on the spot, but he said it was actually the greatest mercy. So that strictness of the, the, uh, the Acharya, that is what helps the devotee, makes us more serious and more conscious. If we let the things go without any comment, then it's not mercy. So. Okay, we'll continue here. So this sort of strictness from God on the devotee is sometimes misunderstood because we are always accustomed to accept what is immediately very pleasing. But we should not... You killed one demon whose name was Madhu, but you are asking me Bhishma Sudhana? Bhishma is my grandfather. And Drona Sudhana, Sudhana means killer. So how can I be that? So very nice explanation by Srila Prabhupada that how Arjuna is thinking that Krishna killed the demon, but Arjuna is in this position. He's supposed to kill his grandfather, his teacher. So he will become Bhishma Sudhana and Drona Sudhana. So it's not very glorious that you get in the, that you killed your grandfather, you killed your teacher. That's not very, uh, to your credit. People will think, what kind of person is this? If Krishna says, how will you maintain yourself, Arjuna, if you give up your ancestral kingdom? Right? So how, how does Arjuna plan to maintain himself if he gives up his ancestral kingdom? He's not going to fight, he's going to give up. What's he going to do to maintain himself? Yes? Some reply? Begging. Go, begging. Go for begging, yeah. Do you think, is that an easy thing for Arjuna to do? Is it? No, he's a Kshatriya. Ah, can Kshatriyas live by begging? Huh? Who can live by begging? Brahmanas. Yes. Brahmanas can live by begging, but Kshatriyas, they cannot beg. Just like when, when uh, Bhima went to get some of the lotus flowers for Draupadi, then he was stopped and they said, you can't go there. These lotus flowers, they all belong to Kuvera and you have to get permission and everything. 
But Bhima said, I'm a Kshatriya, I don't beg permission from anybody. And he had a big fight with the Yakshas and then Bhima beat them and went and took the lotus flowers. And so that's the Kshatriya's nature. They don't beg for anything. All right, so text number five continues. It would be better to live in this world by begging than to live at the cost of the lives of great souls who are my teachers. Even though desiring worldly gain, they are superiors. If they are killed, everything we enjoy will be tainted with blood. Arjuna is speaking that it's, even though it would be difficult for, for me to go and live by begging, but he says that will be better than if I live at the lives, at the cost of the lives of these great souls who are my teachers, right? His teachers. So Arjuna is thinking again about his seniors. If they are killed, then even though I, I may win the battle, but everything we enjoy, there will be that, that feeling that I had to kill my grandfather, I had to kill my teacher in order to enjoy these things. So Arjuna is showing the consciousness of a devotee, how a devotee thinks very deeply before doing something, he's very considerate, He's considering the, the situation very carefully. He's not just passionately rushing in there that where are these people, I'm going to fight them, I'm going to kill them. He's thinking very deeply, is this the right thing to do? And that's a very, that's a very good attitude actually, devotee. Devotee should be like that, he should be very cautious. Okay, so... Arjuna's argument in this fifth verse, Shreya Bhuktam Bhaikshyam Apir Aloke. It is better to subsist by begging for food without having to kill the elders. Though it is a cause of infamy in this life, it will not create impediment in the next life. So this is Arjuna's argument. Yeah, it may be difficult to beg. I have to... I have to go and beg, but it's better than if I have to kill the elders, because if I kill the elders, then that, the problems will come in the next life. I'll have to bear the reactions for killing my family members and for killing my teachers. So that's going to give me a lot of trouble. Although I may have problems in this life by begging, but I won't have any problem in the future. But if I kill them, I'll have problems in the future. This is Arjuna's argument, that I'm, he's worried about the reactions. Bunjiya Bogan Rudira Pradigdan. If they are killed, everything we enjoy will be tainted with blood. So the, that's the consciousness, that if I have to kill them to, in order to enjoy, that consciousness, that remembrance will be there, that I had to kill my family members, my teachers, I had to kill them. That feeling that the, 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 the blood is there, the memory of killing in order to get material enjoyment. So Arjuna is thinking like that, very conscious, very deep thinking and very conscious about the situation. So at this point in the Bhagavad Gita, Prabhupada brings up the point that when a guru is fit to be abandoned, so we know sometimes these things happen, sometimes people are unlucky and they accept the shelter of a guru, then later on they may have to abandon that person, they may have to take another guru or something. So, from Prabhupada's purport, according to scriptural codes, a teacher who engages in an abominable action and has lost his sense of discrimination 
is fit to be abandoned. Bhishma and Drona were obliged to take the side of Duryodhana because of his financial assistance. Although they should not have accepted such a position simply on financial consideration. Under the circumstances, they have lost the respectability of teachers. So, this situation, of course, often, not often, but it does come up. We have seen in our own ISKCON society, within our own institution, that sometimes we accept initiation from a spiritual teacher. And sometimes we, the, the uh, acceptance of the spiritual teacher the, or the selection of the spiritual teacher is made without proper consideration. Now, in except, before we accept initiation from a spiritual teacher, how are we expected to judge who is qualified to be our teacher? Would someone like to tell me? How many of you are initiated? Everyone? Yes? No, Maharaj. Well, you're not initiated? No, Maharaj. Okay, you're not yet initiated. Uh, let's have somebody who is initiated. There must be someone there who's initiated. Yes, Maharaj. Yes, you're initiated, Prabhu. All right, so tell me, yes, how, how did you select your guru? Qualified discipline succession, first thing, parampara, proper parampara. Okay, yeah, but who's to, who's to say he's in the parampara? Yeah, of course, he should be in the parampara. He should be connected to the parampara. In other words, he should have been initiated by somebody else who is in the parampara. Right? So our initiation connects us to the parampara. So, so our teacher should have been initiated by a teacher in the parampara. So is that the only way that you select to go? Anybody who's in the parampara, he can be your guru? No, 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 like he should be perfect, firmly and perfectly situated in Krishna consciousness as per uh, Isha Upanishad uh, says. Okay. So did you, you should be able to judge for yourself? No, Maharaj. Sadhu, Shastra and uh, Sangha, right? So we should also uh, discuss with senior uh, devotees and Shastra as per Shastra and uh, other sadhus should consider him. Oh, you, oh really? Before you, t before you pick your spiritual master, you first of all discuss with other devotees? I, I did my last. I mean, not like that, but before that to know that he is actually, everybody is aspiring from him or they are taking initiation from him. But by that we know that he is, uh, you know, he is qualified to be initiated. Mm -hmm. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Hare Krishna. For me, I felt um, when I looked at my spiritual master, when I heard him, I felt, yes, he's the one who will take me back to Godhead. I was certain, I felt certain, I felt certainty in my heart. How, how often, how long did you hear from him? Um, was it an immediate thing? Immediately, the first time you heard him, you felt he can take you back to Godhead? Uh, Yes, I felt immediately, but then I gave myself time and time over again to be very sure that it is not based on sentimental stuff because me by nature, I'm very emotional. So I wanted to know for sure he is the one. So I gave myself also time, you know, so that it's not based on sentiments or emotions and just because... 
Okay. That's when I felt it deep, yes, for sure, he's the one. Oh, very That's good. That's the time when I asked for shelter. Yes. When we, when we teach the ISKCON Disciple course, I assume that most of you have taken the ISKCON Disciple course by now, have you? Yes, we have. Yeah? So in, in the ISKCON Disciple course, we do try to teach the process of selecting the spiritual master. And during that course, we point out that the proper way to select the spiritual master, as Pr Prabhupada himself recommended, is that you have to hear. You have to hear from him and you have to inquire from him. And Prabhupada said you should hear for one year. You should hear from the guru for one year before you commit yourself to initiation. Yes, and there should be like checking. Both the, the spiritual teacher will check the disciple and the disciple should check the teacher. You have to check because you have to take instruction. Now that's why we first of all we will take initiate we will take instruction first, we'll take the shiksha and then later on the diksha. So first we take instructions and then later on then the initiation. If we take the instructions first, then we are sure we're familiar with the instructions which the teacher's giving. And we're satisfied that the instructions which he, he gives are helpful for us, for our development of Krishna consciousness. But if we take initiation and then later on he gives instruction, oh, I don't like this instruction, I think I want to change my guru, <laughs> then that's not very good. And we do get people, of course, they come to ISKCON and they want initiation and sometimes they want it very quickly. And sometimes they even go outside of ISKCON in order to get initiation. They don't understand that ISKCON is preparing us for initiation. And the preparation is also an important part of the initiation. But if we get initiation very easily, very quickly, then the tendency is we don't value it. So the testing period is important. All right, so here in this particular case it's pointed out that the, the, the respectable teachers, they've lost their respectability, that they took the side of Duryodhan because of his financial assistance. So that's not a good reason. If we accept a guru just simply for financial assistance, that is not the proper mood, right? You don't just think, oh, this guru, he will help my financial situation, so I will take initiation from him. We shouldn't think like that anyway. Okay, are there any questions or comments on this? Everybody's okay? Yes, sir. All right, we'll go ahead. Okay, the fifth objection, indecision. Arjuna is suffering from this problem, he cannot make up his mind. Nor do we know which is better, conquering them or being conquered by them. In other words, should I fight and defeat them or should we let them just conquer us? Arjuna can't make up his mind, what's the right thing to do? Should I fight or not fight? So, then we come to this key verse, very important verse. I think it's one of your memorization verses. Have you been learning your slokas yet? You can, you can all recite for me, go ahead. <coughs> Arpanyato shambhava hatsabhava 
Oh, very nice. You're all very fluent in it, right? So, Dharma Samuda, Dharma Samuda Cheta, what's happening? What's it mean? Dharma Samuda Cheta? Bewildered. Bewildered, right? Bewildered about what? He's confused about his dharma. Dharma, right? He's confused about his duty. And what's the problem? Karpanya dosho. Dosha means fault, right? And karpanya is miser. Miser. The miser, right? Kripaya. Kripa. Right? There's a there's a Brahmana and a Kripana. The Brahmana is a generous person and the Kripana is a miserly person. So Arjuna is describing his confusion because of this miserly weakness. And what is the what is that miserly weakness? Yes, what's the miserly weakness? He does not want to do his duty by, for uh, fighting by killing his relatives. He's too attached to his relatives that he's forgetting his Kshatriya Dharma. Right, he's too attached to the body and his connections to the family and the relatives, the bodily connections, this material attachment. This is what Arjuna describes as miserly weakness. Of course, you know, we'll have that problem, all of us. We get attached to the family and relatives. Maybe you have your own children, you have your mother and father and like this, and we feel affection for them. So Arjuna has understood his weakness. So he's in this condition, I am asking you to tell me for certain what is best for me. Then, shishastiham sadimam tvam prapanam. I am your shiksha. So I want you to instruct me. I want you to give me some shiksha. Tell me what I should do. So this is a wise thing to do. So, of course, Arjuna is fortunate that he's directly in the association of Lord Krishna and he can take instruction from Krishna. What do we have to do? How can we apply this? Yes? Understanding our weakness is the first step, Mara. Understanding that we are in a problem. Understanding that we are in a problem and inquiring from the Master to help me. Okay. Yes, we have to inquire from Krishna's representative. Right? We may not know Krishna. Oh, here's, here's exercise for you to do in pairs. How many people do we have here today? Fifteen marriage. How many? Fifteen. Fifteen only. We're short of a few people. I hope you take the attendance. Okay, so we, we want pairs and there'll be one group of three. And you want to identify general principles from Arjuna's dilemma and how these principles are relevant for our own practice of Krishna Consciousness. All right. So, can we, can someone, who's going to, are you there, Danya Prabhu? Yes, Maharaj. Are you going to put the devotees in pairs? Yes, yes, Maharaj. Okay, thank you, Prabhu. Hare Krishna Prabhu. So do you know the question? Have you understood the question? Yes, Maharaj. Two yes. verses and we have to look at the general principles and also the relevance to our practice in Krishna consciousness. Yes, right. 
Okay, you're partnered with? Okay. Okay, so you can discuss, I'll leave you to it. Recording in progress. Hare Krishna Maharaji. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Are you clear about the question? Uh, I'm not too clear about the question, Maharaj. Okay, you have First, to you have to look at these two verses, text number seven and eight. Maharaj. And pick up the general principles. And then you have to consider how does this apply to your own situation, to our own situation in Krishna consciousness. Okay. Do, you, do you have any similarities between your situation and Arjuna, and the dilemma which Arjuna is in? Mm, yes, Maharaj. <laughs> really? Yeah. Okay, so okay. you look at these two verses and pick out the main principles. Recording in progress. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Madhumati Matiji, Srinivas Prabhu. Are you there? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, okay, you're there. Is Madhumati, is Madhumati also there? I'm not sure. <laughs> she, she usually is. Huh? She usually is there. And wait, she not, not been communicating with you? No. Back uh, a couple of weeks, maybe last week, last week I was with her in a group where she was um, communicating. Okay. So do you know the, do you understood the question, Prabhu, Srinivas Prabhu? No, I, I, it was, I, I didn't understand, so, so to then, understand. You have to look over these two verses, text number seven and eight of the second chapter. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And pick out the main principles. Okay. Which should be, and then understand yourself. How does it apply to you? Okay. Do you have any right. in, a thing in common to Arjuna's situation? Would you? And how can we apply them in our own life? Seven and eight, right, Maharaj? Yes, Prabhu. Okay. Seven. Recording in progress. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Are you Maharaj, are you all right? We, have, we are discussing and we have written some. 
but we are thinking that uh, what um, more examples we can add to it. Okay. So we are thinking. All right. Very good. Thank you, Prabhu. Recording in progress. Just a young devotee. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe it can be one of the points. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Maharaj. Hare, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Prabhu. So, are you alright? Have you had a. Maharaj, have you had we a... have just discussed this now, Maharaj. Okay. So, uh, I would just, we just like to ask you also, Maharaj. Like, for the general principle drawn from Arjuna's dis uh, decision, dilemma, like the compassion part towards his relatives and family members, which we are also facing this in real life, even Durim Prabhu also facing that. So uh, that's the dilemma we are finding, the, the principle we are looking into, which is like compassion towards family and relatives. Like in real life, we are having this issue where we couldn't uh, actually encourage our family members or relatives who are not de devotees to come and join us, to, I mean, do some service to Krishna and engage them in Krishna consciousness and sometimes they are not uh, not favorable to the movement uh, to Krishna consciousness itself so it's it is the dilemma we are facing and how normally we get this done or how we sort this out is that we just simply seek advice from senior devotees and of course Guru Maharaj and also Guru Maharaj that's how we normally uh, apply that in Krishna consciousness life mm. that's the simplest thing we can take up yeah, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly a challenging situation, you know. <laughs> Many devotees around the world, they're faced with the same problem, you know, family members and so on, not cooperative, and some even, yes. again, some, some are very against also, you yes. know. Yes. So make it very difficult. Mm -hmm. So what to do? <laughs> but in this case, Maharaj, if we are supposed to engage them, can we like, uh, we want them to be favorable for our movement. Uh, we don't want to, because they are not uh, very favorable in terms of like worshipping Krishna as a Supreme Lord. They are worshipping the demigods. <laughs> yeah. So in this case, when we, are, we want yeah. to encourage them, can we like ask them to just chant whatever they're doing, just add on Krishna's chanting? and encourage, encourage them by giving prasadam and all that during festivals, encourage them to take fasting during festivals, oh, and yeah. join online classes and all that. Maharaj. Yeah. I mean, if, I if, mean, that's the thing we are doing so far. If they're worshipping demigods, I think you're a lot more fortunate than many other people, because at least they have some belief in something, you know? I mean, they may not worship Krishna, but at least they have you know, they're somewhere on the Vedic, in the Vedic culture, within the Vedic tradition. So that's very nice. You're really fortunate. There's many people much worse, you know. People are, where people are openly atheistic and they're really against, you know. Yeah, because you know, Ray Maharaj, in Kuchi we have very less Indian community. Uh huh. So uh, somehow they're going and visiting in Kuchi here. We are from Kuchi actually, in Kuchi. We have very less Indian community, so all the all the Indian community are going to Sai Center, Sai Baba Center. They go to uh, you know Demigod's temple, and they'll come to Iskon temple as well. Just like it's a daily routine, uh, day day routine, like weekly routine for them. Saturday is Iskon Kuching, Friday gonna be this place like that, you know? Yeah. Well, something. Yeah. Something. Sometimes they go in that mentally. You're lucky, at least you're lumped in with everybody else. At least, they, you know, you're recognized. <laughs> Not so bad. Because at least, of course, you're, your devotees are all from the Hindu community. So they see us also as a Hindu, part of the Hindu culture. You know? 
And so they think of it like that in the, bod in the bodily way. They're thinking, I'm a Hindu, this is also Hindu. They're not, think they're not thinking that this is actually Sanatana Dharma, that this is eternal religious principles, that this is something beyond sectarianism. They're not thinking like that. Yes. So it's, it's certainly different. But still, you know, at least you have the opportunity to, have, to be accepted by them and they recognize you. You know, you're not... Because in Kuching here, Maharaj, we have even Chinese community are very favorable to us, even Christian community are very favorable to us. They will come to our Wisconsin temple here and they will, you know, during the Deepavali, they will be like... Oh, that's, that's Some very... of them, they even will show gila offering during Kartik month. No, oh, wonderful. They gather their religion. Very nice. Very but we find it difficult for our own relatives rather than finding someone outside. The Chinese can do better than our own relatives sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, look, I've got to leave you. I've got to go back Thank here. You. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Recording in progress. All right, Danya Prabhu, you can call, close the meeting. Okay. Do I have to share the screen again? All right. Is everyone back? I think. Yes, sir. All right. So uh, we would like to hear from some one group. Let's hear group number group number two. Who's group two? Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Can you tell us what what did you come up with? Did you get some general principles? Yes, Maharaj. General principle, we got one where it was that, you know, sometimes we know that we have problems. We know that this particular thing is not right for me. And we know that this is our weakness, miserly weakness. But still we cannot solve it, solve it on our own. Like That was what Arjun's problem was also. Okay. That he could identify his problem but he couldn't solve it. Yes, yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. And the other, po other point we came up across is that, you know, so we put forward a lot of arguments based on our limited knowledge and our limited experiences that, you know, we can try and solve the problem this way, that way. And it is mentioned in the purport by Prabhupada that, you know, economic development and social comforts, we tend to rely on them even to solve the problems, but they cannot be solved like that. Ah, okay. And did you talk about how it's relevant in your own practice of Krishna consciousness? Yes, Maharaj. We spoke about especially, you know, how... Uh, with the chanting, I, I know sometimes, you know, I'm inattentive, I know my mind is wandering off, I want to solve, but still, you know, the habit still continues, like, uh, just trying to rely on my limited strength and intelligence that, you know, if I do this, it will get solved, if I do this, then it will get solved. So, so that's one example we came across. Oh, you're and, trying to solve the spiritual problems with a material solution. Yes, Maharaj. Yes. And the other point we came across is sometimes of compromising of principles, like, you know, for example, eating in a vegetarian restaurant or something, which is not offered to Krishna just to please the family members, like just for the affection and, and that kind of thing. So the, knowing that it is wrong, we still sometimes do it just because it's overly affectionate to family and trying to please the family rather than putting Krishna in the center. 
<laughs> the family, they, they want you to go to the restaurant. Huh? <laughs> yeah, that's a problem. The family like to go out together. Hare Krishna, are you there? Yes, Mark. Yeah? Fam yes, yes. So family, they like to go out together and sometimes, sometimes it's going out for a meal and sometimes they want to go to cinema also. Yes, Ma. Sometimes it is like, can we become the normal family? Like, can we? <laughs> yeah, can we become the normal karmis? Mm. <laughs> yeah, very okay, thank you very much, Mary. Thank you, Maharaj. Maharaj, we have discussed some points, Maharaj. Six points we have discussed. Yes, Prabhu. Uh, so one place, Srila Prabhupada says that one should not, I mean, Kripanas means they waste their time in overly affectionate for family, society and country. So for that we discussed that for family attachment we can bring deity in the home so that we can reduce family attachment and be more attached to the deity, bringing Krishna in the center. And for the society being attached more with the Krishna conscious society and devotees, we can reduce our attachment to the society in general. And for the country, uh, if we can develop the consciousness of Vasudeva Kutimbikam, then we don't see the countries as separate and we see everyone and we can preach in that uh, more how, so did, how, did, how did you overcome the attachment to the country? Country, uh, by the consciousness of Vasudeva Kutimbikam, by seeing everything, everyone is related to Krishna as part and parcel and not seeing the country divisions. Oh, okay. And we don't think... Uh, yes, yeah, very interesting, yeah. Very nice. Yes. Yeah. And then another point was Maharaj. Uh, he is a miserly man who does not solve the problems of life as a human. I mean, he has his human body, but he is not solving his problems, being miserly, of utilizing the human body. For that, we have to inquire from Shadu Shastra about the importance of human being and the misery, human life and miseries of uh, material world, being broad minded and use Athato Brahma Jigyasa. Okay, that's another thing we discuss, Maharaj. Oh, and there is another, yes. another important point. Yes, Maharaj. Go ahead. Yes, another important point discussed was a uh, vipra. Uh, Prabhupada writes in the purport about vipra. If a Chaitanya Chaitanya Madhurila, the Prabhupada quotes, it is, does not matter whether a person is vipra or born in a lower family or in a renounced order of life. If he is master of science of Krishna, he is perfect and bona fide spiritual master. This is where we should. This is how we should accept uh, accept spiritual master based on uh, his expertise in science of Krishna, rather than his caste color or his scholarly, uh, you know, uh, being vipra learned scholar. This is another point. From the purpose. Okay. So the birth itself is not the important thing, but it's how much knowledge one has actually realized in the practice of Krishna consciousness. Yes, ma'am. And then another point is the four birth, old age, death and disease. Right? They cannot be countered by accumulation of wealth and economic development. This is another purport from my purport. So, <laughs> so we have to uh, sort after Krishna consciousness with proper determination. Because it, even it says that, uh, you know, it cannot be, so no matter what we try to do, we cannot solve these problems. So only solution is to sort with determination after Krishna consciousness. So that's how we can uh, implement in our lives. Okay. And then another important point Maharaj is, Arjuna says, to solve his problem definitely. The word definitely is very important when we inquire from our spiritual master, we have to inquire for the, uh, the root cause of the problem and trying to look for a, a complete solution, an ultimate solution and not for some temporary solutions. Right. You have to, we don't just treat the symptom, we want to treat the disease, right? Yes. Sir. Sometimes we we, have, we we look at the symptoms and we treat the symptoms. We don't see what is the actual disease. So you're making the point. We don't just want some temporary solution. We want to get the real solution to remove it. Yes, sir. So that we'll, the problem will be gone forever. Yes, sir. Okay. One last point, Maharaj, is that. Uh, Prabhupada writes, it is impossible for him to solve such perplexities without the help of a spiritual master like Lord Krishna. 
So this is very very important that we cannot solve without aspiring to take shelter of a spiritual master. Right. We will not be able to solve this. Okay. Yeah, we need to help. Have the help of Lord Krishna or Lord Krishna's representative in the form of the spiritual teachers. That's essential. Yeah. So this is a very important point from this discussion between Arjuna and Lord Krishna and Arjuna's surrender. Arjuna recognized the need that he has to surrender to Krishna. Although Krishna is his friend, Arjuna is taking, is putting himself in this position to uh, bow at his feet and request Krishna to give him instruction. All right, so we'll go ahead. Let me see. Prabhupada's commenting on solving life's perplexities. Arjuna had a lot of perplexities. We have these problems also in our own life. Prabhupada explains. Academic knowledge, scholarship, high position, etc. are all useless in solving the problems of life. Help can be given only by a spiritual master like Krishna. Therefore, the conclusion is that a spiritual master who is 100% Krishna conscious is the bona fide spiritual master, for he can solve the problems of life. So that's from text number 8, purport. Kripana means one who does not properly use his position. One man is very rich, but he does not use his money, simply sees the money. He is called Kripana. Similarly, Arjuna is powerful, he can fight, he is a Kshatriya, but he is denying his ability. Ah. So Prabhupada brings out this point, Arjuna is being miserly, that he can fight, but he's not willing to do it. He's denying, oh, I don't want to fight. So this way Prabhupada describes Arjuna's miserliness. Therefore he is thinking, I have become Kripana, miser. Although I have got strength, I am denying to fight. Although I have got money, I do not spend. These are called kripana. So, karpanya dosho pahata. Now I am infected with karpanya dosha, with the fault of miserliness. Well, from a lecture in Johannesburg, Prabhupada is explaining this miserly nature, this dharma samudha, this confusion in his duty. Arjuna is confused what to do. And it's due to this miserliness, this attachment to the body. He doesn't want to use his abilities. Prabhupada comments further, It appears that the talk between the master and the disciple was openly exchanged in the presence of both armies, so that all were benefited. So the talks of Bhagavad Gita are not for any particular person, society or community, but they are for all and friends or enemies are equally entitled to hear them. So important points, that this message of Bhagavad Gita is for everyone, regardless of community or society or friends or enemy, but everyone's entitled to hear them. Krishna instructs perplexed Arjuna to defeat Arjuna's argument of compassion. Right? So Arjuna put himself in the position of becoming the student. So Lord Krishna is now the teacher. And Lord Krishna is going to begin by explaining knowledge. And this will go up to text number 30. So this section on knowledge is described here. Oh, <laughs> here's your homework. I don't know when you'll have time to do it, because we have class tomorrow. Anyway, Atma Tattva from text 11 to 30, read your given verses, identify points that explain Atma Tattva. Discuss their relevance in spreading or preaching of Krishna consciousness. So you can think over that, and you, maybe we can discuss that more tomorrow.
No? Is it clear? Text, text 11 to 30, describing Atma Tattva, and identify the points that explain Atma Tattva, Atma Tattva meaning the position of the soul, the science of the soul, and discuss their relevance in preaching Krishna consciousness. Is it relevant? Very relevant. If the people cannot understand the soul, then they will never understand Krishna. So Krishna's beginning as the teacher, and he's again chastising Arjuna, right? Ashochan and Vashochas Twam Pragnavadam Shabasha Se Gatasan Agatasam Scha Nanu Sochanti Pandita. While speaking learned words, O Arjuna, you are mourning for what is not worthy of grief. Those who are wise lament neither for the living nor the dead. So Pragnavadam Shabasha Se, you are speaking like a learned man. Arjuna was speaking so nicely, he was talking about compassion and he was talking about sinful reactions and we may think, oh Arjuna is so moral, oh he's such a learned person, he's so, such a good-hearted soul. But does Krishna think like that? What learned words did Arjuna speak? Well, I just explained some of them, right? Arjuna was talking about being compassionate and men who are worthy of his worship, and he was worried about the degradation of the dynasty. All of these different things indicate Arjuna's learnedness. In chapter, chapter 1, text 28, these are some points about Arjuna revealing his, uh, learned, his, learned, uh, his wisdom. Arjuna said, after seeing the army in the opposite party, drisvenam swajanam Krishna. Hence Krishna says, Anvashocha, you were mourning for those who are not worthy of grief. So Arjuna was mourning for those who were not worthy of grief. He was mourning, but there was no need to mourn for them. Why? Because the soul never dies. In this connection, I told Kutastva Kashmalamidam Vishame Samupashtitam. Even after being consoled by me in such way, you still said, Katam Vishmam Maham Sankhye, etc. You are only speaking, but you are not a learned person, because wise lament neither for living nor for the dead. So Krishna is challenging Arjuna that you are lamenting for what is not worthy of grief. Krishna is continuing to speak, making the distinction between the body and the soul, very important verse. Never was there a time when I did not exist, nor you, nor all these kings. Hare Krishna, please, please mute your mic. If you're going to speak, please mute your mic. Yes, can you can you just mute mute your mic, please, if you're talking in the background? So this very important verse, Krishna's instructions to Arjuna about the eternal nature of every living entity. All right, so we ask you, uh, how do we, how do you deal with the Mayavadi? If somebody comes along and said it's all one, how do you, how can you defeat their arguments? If somebody is pre pre presenting the Mayavadi that Ultimately, it's all one. Ultimately, we're all one with Krishna, and there's no distinction that you and I and Krishna, we're all one. We're all Brahman, and ultimately, we're all going to merge in the oneness. We came from the oneness, and we'll go back and merge with the oneness. So this individuality which we have just now, this is only temporary. This is only in the material world. What are some arguments against the Mayavadi philosophy? 
You cannot just quote Bhagavad Gita. Have you got any ar arguments to give against a Mayavadi? Hare Krishna Maharaj Yes, Prabhu. Maharaj Ji, this, this shaloka is uh, more relevant in this context as uh, Krishna is saying, uh, I was existing in the past, I, I am existing in the present and I will exist in the future. Even Arjuna, Krishna and other people were also existing in the past, even they are existing. But the thing, thing is that we are changing the body from one to another. But I was existing at the time and I will always <clears throat> remain the same. I will be existing. So this is one of the uh, uh, shaloka that we can quote. Yeah, but I'm saying we cannot quote, we cannot just quote Bhagavad Gita. Not everybody is going to accept Bhagavad Gita. You have to be able to present arguments other than just simply quoting a sloka from Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita is not accepted by everyone. So can you give me a logical argument? Maharaj, one argument is we are all persons and if you are accepting a ultimate cause, then the effect should contain, uh, I mean the cause should contain the effect. We cannot be persons without the cause being person. We cannot be deriving from a non-person thing. So we have to be derived from somebody who is a person. So if we are all persons, then the Supreme Lord should be a person. But why does there have to be a Supreme Lord? We all just came from the oneness. We came from the Brahman. There's no Supreme Lord. There's only the oneness of Brahman. Why do you think there has to be a Supreme Lord? Brahman cannot be uh, separated, right, Maharaj, because it says in, I mean, in many places, it says that Brahman cannot be broken into pieces or anything. So... Yeah, but I'm saying you can't use scriptures. Not everyone's going to accept Bhagavad Gita. You cannot just always come back and say Bhagavad Gita says. Bhagavad Gita is not accepted by everybody. You have to be able to argue logically. Maharaj, yes. Sorry, Maharaj. Maharaj, can we just uh, explain in terms of qualitative and also quantitative, in terms of uh, we, we can compare logically like fire and spark? Can we use that kind of explanation? Maharaj telling we are also like spark from a, like fire. We might have the same quality, but quantitatively we are not equal to the Supreme Lord. Can we use an example, Maharaj? Well, again, you're giving, you're talking about the Supreme Lord, but why there has to be a Supreme Lord? I, you know, I've never seen a Supreme Lord. Have you ever seen the Supreme Lord? How do you know there's a Supreme Lord? So here we can give very logical explanation, Maharaj, in terms of we see there is supremacy in everything, meaning we want to find the most uh, person who has the most amount of money or most beauty or either if we keep going on, then there has to be a person by the mathematical law of supremacy, there has to be someone who is superior than everyone. Or we can also take all these planets that are going on, somebody has to be in control of these, all the, uh, uh, you know, control. I mean, supreme control, when we are seeing everything is in control, in place there has to be supreme controller. Everything is in order, in place there has to be a supreme law maker. That's another argument we can give by establishing that there has to be supreme. Mm -hmm. Maharaj, can we say that if all is one, if everything is going into one, then why you and me are not squished into each other? Why your bank account is separate and my bank account is separate? Why don't why do we eat like you know with a soup bowl is there then bread is there? Why if everything is one then why don't we just you know dump everything in and then you know just so we can argue that there is individuality there is uh, variegatedness everywhere. So how can we say that you know all is one? Yeah, that's a very I like that argument. I think that's very good. You know, that it's all one. I am you, you are me. So your bank account is my bank account. And your motor car, you can give your car keys to me. Right? There was one devotee, he went out on Sankirtan and he met the 
this other man and this man was saying everything is one. So the devotee said to him, then give me your car keys and give me your wallet. And he said, okay, thank you, now I'm going. And the, then the man is saying, no, no, wait, wait, you've got to give me back my car keys and, and my money. <laughs> so people talk philosophy, they cannot always apply philosophy. So the idea of oneness, this idea of oneness, that it's all one, there's no variety, and this variety of the material world, this is all illusion, this is not reality. That we, we see that there are, in the, there is individuality, and that individuality is eternal. But the Mayavadis, they claim that individuality is, is only temporary, it's only here, in the material world. So we have to learn, anyway, to, de to debate, we have to learn to deal with these people, not just simply on the basis of Shastra, because there are many Vedantists, you know, if you meet the people, the Vedantist people, they will never accept Bhagavad Gita. They'll laugh at you if you quote Bhagavad Gita. They want to hear from Vedanta. They want to hear from the Vedas. They won't hear Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita is Smriti. They want Shruti. You have to give evidence from the Shruti. And then you've got other people who are more atheistic. They don't accept any scripture. And so how are you going to debate with that? They may have the philosophy of oneness without being based on any scripture, just simply their understanding. They speak of oneness. But they have no, they're, they're not guided by any scriptures, not even impersonal scriptures. So we have to deal with them. We have to give examples. Sometimes you have to give logic. You have to use logic. You cannot always just simply quote scriptures to defeat arguments. Anyway, certainly Krishna has given this verse, and it's a very powerful verse for us who follow the Bhagavad Gita. And Krishna is explaining the eternal nature of the individual. Both Krishna says, I and you and all the kings. So I, first person, you, second person, and all these kings, the third person. So all three persons, they're all eternal in the past, now, and in the future. And so this is the eternal nature of the soul as described in Bhagavad Gita. Certainly, it's, it's difficult dealing with people who have this idea of the oneness and how to deal with them. You can argue with them. And we see Lord Chaitanya dealing with the Prakasananda, Saraswati and Benares. Lord Chaitanya, somehow, by his purity and by his spiritual potency, he could convince them of the importance of chanting Hare Krishna. So Prabhupada told us, he said that Kali Yuga you can spend a lot of time arguing, people don't get any benefit, but let them chant Hare Krishna and eat prasadam, and they can be convinced that way. And so that's a very powerful preaching to Mayavadis. If you can get them to eat prasadam, and you get them also to hear the chanting of the holy name performed by devotees, it can be very beneficial for them. Okay, so defeating impersonalism, Prabhupada said, the Mayavadi theory that after liberation, the individual soul, separated by the covering of Maya or illusion, will merge into the impersonal Brahman and lose its individual existence, is not supported herein by Lord Krishna, the Supreme Authority. Nor is the theory that we only think of individuality in the conditional state supported herein. Krishna clearly says herein that in the future also the individuality of the Lord and others, as it is confirmed in the Upanishads, will continue eternally. The Mayavadi argues that the plura plurality mentioned in this verse is conventional and that it refers to the body. But previous to this verse, 
Such a bodily conception is already condemned. After condemning the bodily conception of the living entities, how was it possible for Krishna to place a conventional proposition on the body again? Therefore, individuality is maintained on spiritual grounds and is thus confirmed by great acharyas like Sri Ramanuja and others. So this is from Prabhupada's purport to text number 12, an important purport. So Prabhupada's explaining here philosophically that the individuality is there eternally and it's on the spiritual platform, the, the, the individuality is in terms of the soul. And, and Prabhupada said, the, these Mayavadis, they say that, oh, when Krishna is talking about uh, I and you, that he's talking about the body. But ultimately it's all one, ultimately the soul is all one. But Prabhupada said, well, Krishna already condemned the body conception. So why would he bring up the bodily conception? He's already rejected the idea that we're the body. So Krishna is speaking on the spiritual platform. Spiritually we're all individuals, eternally. And we don't give up that individuality. Even if you achieve impersonal liberation, you maintain your individuality. Okay, going ahead, text 14. O son of Kunti, non-permanent appearance of happiness and distress and their disappearance in due course are like the appearance and disappearance of winter and summer seasons. They arise from sense perception or sign of Bharat. One must learn to tolerate them without being disturbed. So, brainstorm. We ask you, why should we learn to tolerate? Right? So you can spend a, a few minutes. Any, any responses, any immediate responses about this? You can brainstorm individually. Why is it important for us to learn to tolerate? Anybody has any uh, responses on this? Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yep. Yes, Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, because we need, uh, we need, we should learn to tolerate, uh, so that because this is going to happen anyways, and if we learn to tolerate, we can still concentrate on our main responsibility, that is Krishna consciousness. What do you mean? It's going to happen anyway. Uh, like the changes are going to come like distress and are anyways going to come but if, uh, by learning to tolerate it means that we don't get too disturbed by them and just concentrate on the problem itself or be too engrossed when the time is happy we just get uh, driven by that happiness and how, how can how do you learn tolerance the, are you tolerant are you quite a tolerant person how, how do you learn it you know, if somebody's not very tolerant, how would you recommend that they can learn tolerance? Uh, by associating with devotees. Well, I can't tolerate devotees. <laughs> <laughs> no, Bharat. I mean, to learn from them by their nature. <laughs> the way they behave but in different circumstances. It might be difficult for some people, let me see. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu. Maharaj, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, uh, says, Chena Dapi Suni Chena Chara Dapi Sari Suna Amani Namani Tena Kirtaniya Sadhari. So we can do Kirtaniya Sadhari only when we are tolerant. tolerant. Otherwise, it will not be possible. We, 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 one will always be struggling uh, within the Hari Nam. So how can I become tolerant? If you say you have to be tolerant first before you can do Harinam, how am I going to develop that tolerance? Uh, 
first understanding that we are helpless, Maharaj. I mean, first of all, what is the other option we have? If not to tolerate, we understand that we can be agitated, but that's not going to solve the problem. So first to understand that I cannot solve this problem, this is, I mean, I am helpless. But in that helpless situation, when we take shelter of Krishna, then we can tolerate it. Okay. Understand we're helpless. So what do we need to do in our helpless condition? We need to take shelter of Krishna, our Krishna's representative, right? Okay. Yeah, that's quite nice. Anybody else like to add something more to this? Why, why should we learn tolerance? Prabhupada said, you know, we're not going to get a real taste for the holy name until we tolerate. We want to tolerate. Lord Chaitanya said, be tolerant like the tree, he quoted. And then we can chant the holy name constantly. So we're not going to get the real taste for the name until we become more tolerant. We have to learn to tolerate. What do we have to tolerate? So many adjustments, right? The heat and the cold, the happiness and the distress, honor and dishonor, success and failure, all of these dualities we have to tolerate. Why do we have to learn to tolerate them? Because if we don't learn tolerance, we won't be able to go on in our devotional service. We'll be all the time disturbed that, oh, I'm such a failure, oh, or, oh, I'm so unlucky, or, oh, I'm so good, I'm so great, you know. We have to learn to tolerate without being elated or dejected. We should control the mind, we should be equipoised in every situation that's important for us. So Krishna, Lord Krishna gave the example, heat and cold, happiness and distress. We tolerate, we have to tolerate. In the same way we have to tolerate the dualities of life, important for us. Devotees should be tolerant, it's one of the qualities of a devotee. And we could say you can develop the tolerant, how can we learn to be tolerant? Simply by being a devotee, by trying to become a devotee, then we can develop these qualities. So we come into the association of devotees and in the beginning it's a little difficult. For some people at least anyway, when we come into association with devotees there will be difficulties, some adjustments to be there, the dress, the food, the living style, there are so many things that are a little different and we may find it difficult, we have to tolerate. We should learn to tolerate. Because by tolerance we will develop some purification that is purifying for us to tolerate these different conditions. There's some, my, some of my thoughts on the matter. Anybody else like to add? Okay, Srila Prabhupada said, one has to follow the prescribed rules and regulations of religious principles in order to rise up to the platform of knowledge, because by knowledge and devotion only can one liberate himself from the clutches of maya. Well, we have to follow the rules and regulations, we have to, we have to tolerate <laughs> these rules and regulations. It's important for us, they purify us. Then, the austerity, however, should not be whimsical or artificial. Srila Prabhupada's example was that he was constantly accepting the natural austerities that would come in the discharge of his devotional service. But he wouldn't concoct unnecessary austerities just to make a show of tapasya. All right? Prabhupada accepted natural austerities. For example, anybody? What were some of the austerities Prabhupada accepted? 
Anybody know? Very little sweet sleep, Maharaj, and waking up and translating books in the night. Yes, okay. Very, very uh, less sleep. Only sleeping a few hours and getting up in the middle of the night to write his books. Very good. Yes? Srila Prabhupada uh, prepare food, um, then offer it to uh, Krishna and then distribute prasad to everybody and then clean that place. So he, he, he was doing all this uh, austerity. Yes, in, in, the beginning, in the beginning of the Krishna Consciousness Movement, certainly, in 26 Second Avenue, and like that, in the very beginning, Prabhupada was cooking for all the devotees and serving them. Yes? He travelled around the globe, uh, circled the globe at least 14 times in his span. Yes, of yes, a great austerity, so much travelling. Oh, yes, so diff he went, I remember, he went to Malaysia and he traveled from Kuala Lumpur in the car, they took the car, there was no air conditioner in the car and then there was no highway, it was just the regular roads with traffic lights and, you know, not very good roads and Tra Prabhupada had to travel on the roads for hours and then he got to the place and the devotee said to Prabhupada, he said, Prabhupada, do you want to take rest for a while? He said, we'll do the program, you must be tired after all the traveling. And Prabhupada looked at him with disgust, he said, I've taken so much trouble to come here, do you think I want to rest? I've come here to preach, let me preach. And so Prabhupada was in that mood, he accepted the austerity for the preaching to get the preaching, so much austerity he accepted, constantly travelling and at the same time writing his books, very difficult, you know, at, at his age, in his seventies and he's travelling so much and you know, so many flights and so many difficulties, not easy really, a lot of austerity and then when he came I remember uh, the devotee said he wanted Prabhupada to live in the hotel. Prabhupada said, I don't want to live in the hotel, I want to live in the temple with the devotees. Prabhupada liked that austerity, living with the devotees. Alright, so tolerance is very important for us. We have to train ourselves to tolerate, not to get too erratic. Right? If we're emotional, we should try to subdue these emotions. All right, going ahead. Bhagavad Gita 2.15, Samadukha Sukham Diram, not disturbed by happiness and distress. Yes. What is my duty? One who tolerates inconveniences and continues performing his devotional service steadily gradually transcends the bodily platform and becomes eligible for liberation. See, 10.14.8. Anybody know that verse, 10.14.8? Very famous verse. Right, that's it. Yes, do you know the translation? Well, it's paraphrased here. One who tolerates inconveniences and continues performing devotional service steadily, gradually transcends the bodily platform and becomes eligible for liberation. That is the paraphrase of the meaning of that verse, Tattenu Kampam. The famous verse, Prayers of Lord Brahma in the 10th Canto Srimad Bhagavatam. In other words, whether in happiness or distress, festival or calamity, one should simply consider, what is my duty? Right? What is my duty? What is your duty? My duty is, and here's a nice statement here from Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur, he's describing in one of his songs, Domara sevaya dukha ho jat jato seyo to parama sukha seva sukha dukha parama sampada 
nashayi avidya dukkha. All the troubles encountered in your service shall be the cause of great happiness. For in your devotional service, joy and sorrow are equally great riches. Both destroy the misery of ignorance. So Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur said, both joy and sorrow are riches because they help us to get rid of ignorance. The real ignorance is identifying with the body. And the troubles which we accept for the service of Krishna, that brings us joy, brings us happiness. So this is from Bhaktivinoda Thakur's songbook, Sharanagati. And the Sharanagati means surrender, and there are six items of surrender. So this is Atmani Vedanam, Atmani Vedanam, self-surrender. It's described there about duty. Okay, so... Oh, Krishna. Okay, can somebody read this for me? It's actually the best of men who Shara Sabha should not be disturbed by any material condition, but simply discharge his duties. And what is what is the duty? Duty is to become immortal. So Amritatvaya Karpate. The formula is given here by Krishna how to become immortal. That means you should be oblivious to so-called happiness and distress of this material world. One who doesn't care what is the distress and happiness of this body must execute Krishna's con Krishna consciousness. That is the qualification. One who says, oh, I cannot execute Krishna consciousness because there are so many in inconveniences is not fit for becoming immortal. All right. Would you like to comment on this? Prabhupada is oh, um, speaking about tolerance, right? Yeah. Prabhupada is saying we shouldn't be disturbed by the material conditions. Simply do our duty. That's the important thing. Our duty is service to Krishna. It doesn't matter what the conditions are. Just like the devotees, they go out in the winter, they go out in the summer, they're doing sankirtan, they're doing book distribution, sometimes they're doing food for life, some kind of service. They do it. They don't get, they're not thinking of happiness or distress. It's simply the consciousness, I'm the servant of Krishna, my duty is to do some service. It doesn't, we don't worry about the body. So this, this is Krishna Consciousness. But if we think, oh, I cannot do this, oh no, there's so many problems, no, this is not right, then, then it means you won't go back to Godhead. You're not ready to go back to Godhead. We have to be neutral, we have to be indifferent to all the difficulties. One devotee from England he wrote to Srila Prabhupada about how they were traveling in a vehicle and they were traveling around England and they were distributing books and he said sometimes it's very cold and sometimes it's snow and he said sometimes we were just, we we're sleeping in the van at night and we'll get out of the van in the morning and we'll just wash ourselves in the snow. And when Prabhupada read this, Prabhupada was very pleased. He could. He said, I can tell all of these austerities which you're doing, they're just like a game, just like fun for you. You're just like children, you're enjoying. He said, you're doing austerities greater than the greatest yogis. But he said, this is, this is Krishna consciousness, that you don't get disturbed by the different 
conditions and you don't say, oh, I need this, I need that, I need this facility. No, a devotee will just serve Krishna, whatever is provided by the arrangement of Krishna. He's happy to accept that. We don't have demands. All right? Going ahead. So Krishna defeats the argument of this compassion. From both viewpoints there is no cause of lamentation, because the living entity, as he is, cannot be killed, nor can the material body be saved for any length of time, or permanently protected. Now we have a material body, it's going to die sometime. We cannot think it's going to live forever. And the living entity, he cannot be killed. He's a soul. He's going to take birth some other place. We give up one body, we'll take birth some other place. There's no reason to lament. In this way, Arjuna is arguing, uh, rather, Lord Krishna is defeating Arjuna's argument against compassion. All right, so that was text 18. You go until verse 19. And that will end the lesson three. <laughs> All right? Now, understanding, we talked about Arjuna's reasons for not fighting. Do you remember Arjuna's reasons for not fighting? Anybody can remember? Yes, sir. Yes? Compassion, enjoyment, uh, sinful reactions, uh, destruction of identity, and indecision. <laughs> And, and what were the new new reasons in second? Indecision. 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 Not indecision. And what else did he tell Krishna? He said, "You are Madhusudan. You want me to be Bhishma Sudan and and Drona Sudan." And then we spoke about general principles from Arjuna's dilemma and surrender to Krishna, and how it relates to our own practice. So, Arjuna was, had a problem, miserly weakness, his attachment for the family members. And the same way in the practice of our own Krishna consciousness can often be greatly restricted with the, you know, sometimes with job and sometimes with family relationships that they can cause us to, we're required to compromise in our practice of Krishna. And so sometimes it, it creates difficulties for us. We spoke about the individuality of the soul. The soul is individual both in the conditioned and liberated states. Material world we're conditioned, spiritual world we're liberated, but the soul is eternally an individual. We keep our individuality. Lord Krishna said, in the past, now, and in the future, we're individuals eternally. The process of transmigration, the process of transmigration with reference to Bhagavad Gita 2.13, I can't remember that exactly what that was, I have to look at that. And then personal experience, the importance of the quality of tolerance and practical ways to achieve it. The importance of the quality of tolerance. I, I had the experience one time, I was with a group of devotees in a, in a third world country and we were out on Harinam Sankirtan one day and we were in front of a major store in the city and uh, we were standing there chanting and one of the devotees who was in, my, in the party, suddenly he went running at the crowd of people who were gathered there and he was swinging the cartels and yelling at people and I, I thought, what on earth happened? I didn't know, it was quite a sudden thing and I couldn't understand what happened. I, had, I was there and we were chanting and dancing and then suddenly this devotee rushed out at the people with the cartels and people who were watching, they screamed because he was waving the cartels violently. So I grabbed him and I asked him, what are you doing? And he said, I couldn't tolerate 
He said they were they were saying things about us. He said I couldn't tolerate. I said, oh my goodness. <laughs> so quality of tolerance is really very very important. Uh, a good example of tolerance. One devotee was on book distribution, and he was in the airport in America, and he offered a book to someone, and the person who he offered the book to just simply threw a punch and hit him in the face. So what do you do in that situation? Do you fight back? That devotee, he was not a, a weakling and he was not cowardly, but he didn't want to make a scene. So he simply said, thank you, Krishna. That is tolerance. That is the tolerance of a devotee. Another devotee, uh, Madhavananda Prabhu, is a, often giving lectures about Jagannath Puri, he's often seen online giving classes, Madhavananda, quite a scholarly devotee. He describes when he used to distribute books in America, and there was a few occasions he said people would come and punch him and knock him to the ground. You have to tolerate these things. Don't expect everybody can appreciate. So do, we, get, we get this training in tolerance. It's important for us that we learn to tolerate and don't get too much disturbed by it. And how to achieve it? Well, simply by engaging in devotional service, then we do get tested. Lord Krishna does arrange these things. He tests us. He tests us. He, that we're put into different difficulties and different un, unwelcome situations, and we have to learn to tolerate them. So simply by engaging devotional service, we learn to become more tolerant. As it said, all the good qualities develop in one who is a devotee. So simply by engaging in Krishna conscious activities, we do get a lot of training in tolerance. And then we spoke about arguments to defeat the Mayavadi concept of soul merging after liberation. So, as I said, we cannot just simply present verses from the scriptures to defeat this. You want to give some logical arguments to try to explain that this Mayavadi concept of merging after liberation, that this is not logical. Uh, sometimes we give the example that if we take all the parts of a watch, we take, we take all, all, all the pieces apart and then shake them together in your hand and then throw them up in the air, are they all going to come down together in order with a watch? They're not going to all fit together exactly as they were before. So Mayavadi philosophy, they say ultimately everything, this whole world is illusion. So if it's all illusion, why are they trying to enjoy it? Then if everything is illusion, why are they speaking? There's nothing to say. If it's all illusion, then you don't need to speak. Why do they talk so much? And so the idea of the soul merging after liberation, we give up our individuality. giving up our individuality, but we are, we are individuals, we do have an in, individual nature. We, people will say, well, that's illusion, that's, uh, and they say, oh, the, this world is unreal, Brahman Satyam Jagat Mitya, that the world is false and only the Brahman is true. So they'll talk like that. So these things have to be discussed more. There are many arguments, of course. You go on arguing with Mayavadis, get nowhere. Prabhupada's final quote, Father and teacher is advised by Chanakya Pandit, you should always chastise your son and disciple. Always find out mistake. Don't be angry. But it is the business of the teacher and the father simply to find out your mistakes, not to find out your good things. Never recognize the disciple's business or son's business as very good. Then they will spoil 
That is the injunction of Chanakya Muni. So, so far we are concerned. When our spiritual master used to chastise, we took it as blessing. That was very nice. And he would chastise like anything. Damn rascal, foolish, stupid, anything. All good words. Okay, Srila Prabhupada ki jai. So tomorrow we're going to go on. You can look over chapter 2, text 20 to 38. Okay, Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Jai. Okay. Any, are there any questions, comments, anybody? All right, we'll meet you tomorrow at the same time. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Hare Krishna.